Okay, we're live. Uh, yes, uh, welcome back, our, our vast viewership, to Code Talk Teach, our uh, kind of technical talk show by uh, us at Oasis Digital. Uh, I'm Kyle Cordes. So I work here. Uh, you guys want to give your introduction? I'm Lance Finney. I also work at Oasis Digital. I'm Zach McKipping. I also work at Oasis Digital. Okay, so uh, as usual, we have our main topic, and our main topic is going to be about uh, kind of how, how much how much to customize stuff where stuff is pretty broadly defined in the software dev world versus how much to try to do things out of the box. But as usual, we have a couple of kind of small topics. Um, I guess one of the small topics is it feels like we're in the, we're still in the August lull, even though it is now September. But I think, I feel like every late summer, there's sort of a, a dearth of news and activity in late summer. And so I'm kind of excited that we're kind of, I guess, at the end of late summer. So we should start to see some, some interesting activity picking back up again. Um, Lance, you brought up this thing, which I think I termed multi-track conference FOMO dilution. Do you want to describe that phenomenon? Well, uh, what I was referring to there is a couple weeks ago, there was a conference that, a virtual conference that I got a ticket to and I wanted to attend. And as the summer, uh, Early in the summer, I thought I'd be able to attend a lot. And as I got closer, I had a bunch of client meetings and it just wasn't possible for me to attend. And for some of the other conferences we've had in the past, like NGConf, I really, I, I, I felt bad if I was going to miss it because it was single track and all of the people in the community who were watching were going to be in the same chat room together and I'd be able to chat with people. And like, you know, if Ward Bell was saying something controversial, I wanted to be there for it. Well, this other conference was three track it had a um a keynote address for everyone but then after that it split up and what i realized is that actually decreased my uh motivation to attend because i was already going to have fomo if i got there and watched one track i would have the fear of missing out on the other two well the fomo of missing two tracks versus missing three tracks is kind of trivial no matter what i did to attend this conference if I cared about the content, I was going to have to go back and watch videos later. Whereas when there's a single track, there's only the one thing to be missing out on. So if I'm missing out, I'm missing on the one party. So uh, yeah, it just it was an interesting consequence of the design of the conference. <laughs> That's fantastic. You know, I like live. Like we're doing a live event now, even though we typically get far bigger afterwards viewership than live viewership. Well, we, we teach live classes, right? So like, you know, I, I think I love live events, but I also really like skipping live events and just watching the videos later at 2X. Um, sometimes I can go to 2X, depends on who's talking. People that talk relatively slowly, I can do to 2X. Uh, some people I can only do 1.25. But yeah, the uh, I, I feel like maybe the first few times we had a bunch of conferences go online, I felt this strong FOMO. But yeah, it's just the FOMO is diluting. I think both the multi-track thing, but also just the passage of time. It's not that hard to go back and watch later. And plus, when you watch later, you can kind of wait and see. You can kind of let the community kind of vote on what was really important, right? Like if there's if there's something people are talking about, well, yeah, go watch that one, right? Um, Zachary, what do you think? I almost so, exclusively just watch everything past, um, just because. Well, and I can, like you mentioned, you can speed it up and everything like that because a lot of people talk slowly, uh, at least yeah. for me. Um, also, I just listen to them in the background like that and other videos and other streams just while I'm working. And that's how I consume most things like that nowadays, honestly. So doing like a live event doesn't really matter for me as much unless I'm like the one on the like, front end side of it. So. Yeah. Um, you talked about you know being able to kind of watch in the background. I've also find that I can kind of get by paying partial attention. And then every once in a while, like I'm paying enough attention that if something really novel comes up, if I hear something I'm a little bit surprised by, I'll stop, rewind a couple minutes and give up my full attention for a few minutes. Yeah, exactly. Um, Especially if there's just, something on screen, right? If there's some code snippet or whatever, like I'm not yeah. visually looking at it all the time. So a lot of times I will just pause, rewind. Yeah, but then somebody, attention. they'll say something about it. You go, oh, wait, I need to go see this thing that's being talked about. Um, I don't know. I, I, like, yeah, you could argue it's kind of, maybe it's, you know, disrespectful to not give the speaker your full attention. That's probably, that's probably true when you're in the room with a speaker. Yeah. But when you're consuming 
you know, and you're dipping into this river of content afterwards, it kind of, you're kind of giving more of a shot to more different speakers by spreading your attention off little bits and pieces, right? Do you want to, do you want to watch one talk all the way through with your full attention at 1x? Or do you want to pick up, you know, snippets of five talks at 2x? Well, you know, maybe you're giving five times as many people an opportunity to make an impression or to, you know, to really, really catch your ear. Um, okay, then we had one more little kind of small topic, which I believe Lance brought this also. There's an issue in the Angular issue tracker, and it's, a, it's actually an issue that kind of goes beyond Angular, and it's about, uh, it's about not doing TypeScript type checking in like the blocking path to compiling a program. Uh, it turns out there's a bunch of competing web dev tooling out there for a bunch of competing libraries and frameworks that already do this kind of trick hack optimization where you compile the code, but you just don't type check it. So you basically do type, TypeScript without type checking, and you do that as fast as possible. Here, I'll, I'll bring, this, uh, bring the link up here. You, you, you get the results on the screen running as fast as possible. Then in the background, there's some process doing type checking to tell you, oh, by the way, this program that is now running, it doesn't type check correctly. Um, and I actually think that, I think that's pretty genius because anything that speeds up that dev cycle just like turns directly into more results you get for less of your life you have to give up to get them. So I think that's ingenious. I'm thrilled that there's now an item getting attention to add that to Angular. Um, yeah, especially when like the type checking itself doesn't, like it, it can impact things for sure. But like your code's more than likely just gonna run no matter what. And if you see errors, cool. But the type checking itself is more just like an after, it's almost like a lint almost, right? Where you're going yeah. after the fact and you're, you're just fixing the small things to make everything cohesive and well, kind of like just yeah, fixing like up a, the issues. Like a type, a type error can be a real bug, certainly. Sure. I mean, yeah. it, and it, it can like help me as a developer, but you know, just statistically of all the reasons I might, I might not be done yet, I might need to keep editing unquestionably less than 100% of those will be type errors. And so anything that lets me see the results of my work and then keep editing, just seems, it seems it's just like a, a pure win. And I, I really hope this item, here, I'll put it back up on the screen here. I really hope this item makes it in, in a timely way because I feel like almost everyone will benefit from that. One thing I'm slightly scared is people will find a way to uh, skip the type checking forever instead of only unblocking the dev cycle. Um, I mean, hopefully it would still happen on like a full prod build, but. I yeah. mean, hopefully, but it seems almost inevitable that eventually we'll have a project land on our plate uh, as consultants who come in to you know, help companies with hard problems. Say, hey, we've got a thousand components. We've got about uh, you know, 400,000 lines of code right here, and uh, <clears throat> it, uh, it doesn't type check at all because we turned that off two and a half years ago. Can you help? So I feel like that's almost inevitable that that'll happen eventually, and uh, you know I guess we'll we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I hope I definitely hope it's the case where, like, because there's are differences between like a build and a serve in the uh, Angular.json, like their actual yeah. runner, I guess. So I'm hoping they just limit it straight up to serving and. Don't yeah, yeah, reporting. maybe they'll if they put the option in building, people are going to use it. Yeah, a fact. A so, absolutely. If the option is there, a, a, an option that exists, some people will switch. Absolutely. Okay, well, I guess, our, I guess that's enough. Our, our main topic is to what extent does it make sense? What do we prefer? What are the trade-offs? To what extent of trying to like do things in the default way that just comes out of the box versus tweaking things? And I feel like we can talk about this at you know five different levels. We can talk about it like your IDE settings, like kind of your local dev environment. We can talk about it in terms of like, how much does a project just use the default settings of the library or framework that it's built on? Uh, talk about for lint settings. Should you just you know, use the default lint settings versus tweaking them up just right? Um, even up to the design of a system, right? There are, there are sort of these common ways that systems are, are built, right? Should we, I mean, if you, kind of, if you just kind of go down the happy path with a lot of backends, you end up with a monolithic backend. Is that a good path? Or should you kind of go to the greater amount of work to do a bunch of, uh, of you know, of a, I don't know, a microservice stuff, that kind of thing. 
Look at this. We even have a, a comment back on the previous one from David Moore, who's watching here. Um, here we go. Here's the previous one. Great. Yeah, great comment, David. Fantastic. Um, okay, so, uh, so I guess I'll go first here. So uh, the layer at which I'll talk about this a little bit is the IDE. So I have used many, many IDEs over time. And for a long time, I resisted customizing because I found that the less customized a tool an IDE is, the easier it is to sit down with a fellow developer and help them. Um, and I feel, I feel like I got a lot of benefit from doing that. Um, since then, though, like recently, I've been actually customizing quite a few like, keyboard bindings on VS Code, which is what I use most frequently now. And part of the reason I've been doing that is to find keyboard bindings that will work acceptably, acceptably nicely for me across the platforms that I use. So I end up using Mac, Chrome OS, and occasionally Windows. And I, I, I need to be able to like have my fingers find the keys on all of them. So I, I found myself doing a bit more customization than I used to, just to sort of tolerate the weirdnesses about my environment. So I saw some nodding. What do you think? What I was actually reminded of is conversations back oh, in my Java days about people who wanted to switch between um, Eclipse and IntelliJ. And people who would, I don't know, I'll go from one to the other, but I'm going to set my key bindings to be the key bindings of the other one. <laughs> and that's great if you never work with anyone else. It's also, but it kind of locks you into the other mindset. Um, so that you never actually learn the real tool that you're using in front of you. Um, because sometimes, you know, they, they, they put, they have different philosophies for why mm -hmm. this is an alt M versus an alt L. And if you are consistent within the defaults, it'll make sense and easier, be easier to remember. But if you don't, then it'll be hard and you end up with this hodgepodge. And then the hard part, the worst part is, as you hinted at, if you're pair programming at all, it's just useless. Like you can't use your machine to pair program because anyone who sits down and says, oh, that's IntelliJ. I know what key bindings are. And you start typing and then it, the world blows up in front of you. Um, I mean, I have the obligatory joke here about, you know, my, my security solution is Emacs. Nobody who steps up to my machine can figure out how to exit the editor and right. therefore I'm safe from being hacked. Uh, okay, go ahead. Um, yeah. So yeah, it just, it, with an editor, I would say, like, I'm fine to tweak my settings because like, I use WebStorm generally uh, these days. And there are a couple settings that I like to do, a couple commands I like to do that exist within the editor but don't have key commands, shortcuts. So I'll add those, but I'm not going to, but if there's already one in place, I'm not going to change it to something that's not the default, but I'll add one for you know uh, making sure to add lines together or whatever it is. But yeah, I'm not going to change it so that it's going to make it hard for anyone else to use my editor for pair programming. I think that's a great insight that there's a big difference between additive tweaks versus changing the things that are the common baseline we all get from the default. And I bet that idea is going to apply at many layers of this conversation. So I, I think that's really important. Zachary, I think you were about to talk. You look like it. Uh, kind of. So I, I kind of agree with both of those where I don't really edit that much because, again, pair programming and being in a class, um, you kind of want your stuff to be as default as possible. Um, but there are a few things that I actually do, like uh, not only in extensions, but also just in other tools. Um, one of the main ones, and this is one I usually talk about in classes too, is save all versus just save on the current file. I bind control S to save all always. It's just something I've always done. And I know some I people go as far as like I do that when, you, too. when you like alt tab or change focus, it'll save all as well. Um, but yeah, that's one of those things. And even in classes, I'm just like, yeah, you might as well set this to save all. It'll save you mass amount of headaches. Um, I actually reverse them so that I, I, I can use a, another modifier to when on the one time out of 50 that I want to save just one file. Oh, yeah. yeah That's yeah, like exactly. an extra reach, but the yep. default operation saves all. I think, yeah. That's yes, exactly that, 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 I feel like that's relatively harmless, although it has messed me up where I sit down for a group programming session and I press the wrong save keys and, I'm, and people are like, hey, it didn't save right. Sorry. Um, let me see here. 
So <laughs> as long as we're talking about do. key bindings, let me see if I can demonstrate this correctly. So my mouse has keys oh, okay. on it that can be bound. So I have actually went to the effort of customizing those keys to do useful things for me in, in my working environment on my computer, you know, outside of my IDE. Uh, and anybody else have gone to the effort of actually programming your custom buttons on your device? I have not. So do you have buttons weird. you could though, or you just haven't gotten to, or does your just you don't? I yes. Yep. Look at that. Yep. You've, those buttons are just sitting there tempting. Yeah. Maybe pr program one of those to save all and like blow people's minds during a development session. They're like, hey, how did you save that? Are we only touching the keyboard? Apparently, so I'm now I'm, I'm, I'm opening in a different window so I don't mess up my participation in this conversation. But I think one of them might be like a back button. Hmm. Yeah, I think the defaults for me are yeah. like forward and back. So yeah. I just kind of keep them as is, which is funny because like in video games, I always bind those to something. But in coding, I never bind them to anything, <laughs> which is yeah. interesting. Well, coding yeah. is just another game, man. I, yeah, got a yeah. game of fire code. Yeah, they, you, they, they are forward and back buttons, and I have never used that besides the last two minutes. I think you can set Discord to show VS Code as the game you're playing. Yeah, there's a Discord presence extension. I have that, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I haven't gotten to extensions yet. It's I a know, game. It's a single yeah. player game. Well, the nice thing the is like, it, it'll show like VS Code plus the project you're working on plus like the file you're on. So like you, I purposely disabled it on yeah. some things, but for some stuff where I'm just doing like open source of my own junk, I was like, sure, throw it up there. Yeah, you yeah, doing some kind of filter to not like put names of somebody else's stuff yeah. in your presence. You can always disable extensions for workspace, so. Yeah. But for other key lines, like for me, it's literally like, like the control S thing. I've only swapped like two or three things, like terminal focusing, stuff like that. Um, like I just change it slightly to make my own life a little bit easier. Um, and then I also use, I don't know if anyone's ever used this one, um, on the topic of extensions. Uh, let me see if I can get the Yeah, I mean, actually, this. that's a great direction to go, Zachary. So like, uh, I have, a, I have a bunch of Visual Studio Code extensions. A long time ago, I worked in IntelliJ IDEA, and I had a pile of extensions. Before that, I worked for years in Eclipse, and I had, I had like uncountably many extensions. I had so many extensions that a regular part of my environment was dealing with uh, conflicts between extensions. Mm. Here, I'll, here, I'll, I'll, I'll put this up on the screen here. So uh, what, what is this extension, Zachary? This one, um, this one helps if you want to do like a very, very custom keybinds for certain actions in your code. So for me, the only, like literally the only use I'd use for this, because I didn't go too far with it because it could get kind of crazy. Um, VS Code by default allows you to kind of like highlight a line, just like an entire line. Yeah. But for me, that always grabbed the new line character as well. So hmm. if I wanted to copy a line and paste it, I was always get that new line okay. and it's really annoying. So I just made a custom macro using that extension, assigned it to a keybind, and instead of doing a whole line select that grabs a new line, it just whole line selects and ends at the very end of the line. So something simple like that, but I had to go get an extension for it, that's and then I like, do a little bit of coding. So <laughs> that's like a but. serious customization. So did you know that you can triple click in VS Code, and that picks the whole line, and you can drag? Yeah, but I'm lazy. I don't like to use my mouse. <laughs> You know, I, I, I think there's a, I think there might be some some chord you can do that that does it, that that Very gets possible. whole lines at once. But triple click is an action that VS Code has. Um, by the way, so along these same lines of of you know customizing your environment. So, um, you know, nerd alert here. Uh, uh, you know, nice. mechanical keyboard, but it doesn't have enough rows, right? It doesn't have enough rows. Oh, there's it doesn't not have a function, function key? key row. Okay. And so there's a function key that runs the function keys, but there's a bunch more buttons you want. And so what you end up doing is using the software that it comes with to customize various chords to do various keys. And so like I have a chord that does the volume key. I have a chord that does the, the play, play, pause, media key. Um, but there are people that go far beyond that and, and you know, set up, uh, you know, a, set up keyboard combinations that other people don't even have that key or that keyboard and set those up 
to do a uh, you know to do operations in their IDE. I've heard of people that have foot pedals that with foot buttons that do things in their IDE. Never gone that far. Um, so how about just general like. Uh, this, we're still talking about, I guess, individual developer level, right? So staying at the individual level, working on your own machine, like, what's your inclination in terms of customizing or tweaking? Here we go. We're going to, I guess we'll put up the, the triple click comment. In case yeah, sorry. I it. just was messing with that. <laughs> That's great. Um, wh what's your inclination in terms of how much to customize your own machine? You know your main dev machine. So not we're not talking like you know gaming machines. People always customize the crap out of gaming machines. But like your machine for dev, are you inclined to to tweak a bunch of stuff or just kind of use it pretty much out of the box? I mean, what, what you make me think of is all the stickers I had on my previous one. But that's not really what you're asking. Well, actually, uh, no, that, that's actually you know I think that's actually the ultimate extension of it, right? Because that's even past. You know, obviously stickers are are not going to be functional. Right, yeah. a, st a sticker is not a button. Although, if you can make a sticker that was a button, yeah. Um, I mean, this is this is my previous work laptop, and I had a whole bunch of Angular related stickers on it. Too. But you know, it, you know, the, the HDMI port stopped working, and the fan got ridiculous, and so I have a new laptop that doesn't have any stickers on, partially because so I, I haven't gone to any conferences since this happened, <laughs> <laughs> but also because like I spent all the energy putting all the stickers on here, and now I can't use them anymore. So it just kind of the the bloom. Kind of fell off that rose a little bit. You're gonna have to. I mean, we're gonna have to get back into the world of in-person conferences, and it's gonna be gonna gonna be sticker time at the first one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess stickers are kind of the the ultimate purely decorative, right? They're literally on the outside of the machine. How about inside the machine? As I, I was looking around, and like, so not only does my keyboard have, do I have a dozen plus custom bindings on my keyboard? Like my computer is like fully customized. I have windows coming up where I want. I have a, a, a command line keystroke thing that I can run of 50 different commands on my Mac that are not in the box on Mac. There's equivalent things on Windows. Um, what, like when I bring up a project in VS Code, like I said, I, I have all my VS Code extensions and I even have other apps on my machine that are handy to use in development. Um, versus I, I know that some of our development we do here as a team is on fairly locked down computers mm -hmm. where it'd be kind of a pain to even get arbitrary software installed on them. Um, you know, like on, so on, how, how does that work out? How, how much do you guys tweak, tweak your computer? I know for me on the console side, like the terminal side, um, I used to use a program con, called con emu, which was like yeah. a console emulator. And yeah. that thing was awesome. Like I really, I to this day, I still really like it because I had, custom key binds for opening up different types of terminals and different like home directories and things yep. like that, or just running on, a command, right? When I was on Windows, I used a very similar thing to yeah. that because I wanted a so, powerful terminal, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And like getting that compared to like command prompt or something like that on Windows was like, whatever, I want to be able to get bash, get whatever, all inside one thing. Nowadays though, I just use the, what is it called? The uh, Windows terminal, right? So yeah. that newer thing that you have to like, Kind of opt in for on Windows. Yeah, they've and improved that thing, that it much That thing's pretty much to a point where I like it. Um, there's a few small things like not being able to drag out a tab into a new window, or whatever. But for the most part, it replaces a lot of the stuff I was using with Connie. But anyways, I'm um, so like obviously a few minor things because the Connie move has been there forever um, and has a lot of functionality. But it's pretty much getting there, and that's nice because it's out of the box, right? So if I am on like a um, like a client laptop or something, I can still get that, and there's not a huge deal with it. Versus Kanemu is, I wouldn't say sketchy, but it's kind of one of those things. Like, is this accepted? Is it not on a client project for downloads or whatever? So it's kind of nice. I, I feel like there, there's an important weighing factor there that kind of whether the default tools, again at any different layer, which we're going to talk about some of the layers in a minute, if the default tools are good enough then like laziness or opti optimizing your effort is the overwhelming force. So we just use the default tools. But if the default tools are sufficiently bad or sufficiently incomplete, then we'll like customize stuff. Um, like I, I used to have a multi-display Windows machine before Windows had very good support for multi-display. 
And so I had to use a custom start bar app because the built-in start bar behavior was not good enough for really effective multi-monitor use in the earliest multi-monitor days. But then at a later time, it got improved so much, I, I threw all that away and just use what's in the box and it was sufficient. Yeah, it's amazing how much less time, or how much more time I have for my life now that I'm not doing any Sigwin. <laughs> yes, because yeah, no you know, That's Git no Bash joke. is, you know, I, I can just set up Git Bash within the Windows terminal, and it just yeah. works, and so I don't need to do all that stuff. Yeah, Git Bash is sufficiently good, and like seems to always work. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, I think I it's pretty good. Pretty good discussion of like the individual developer layer. So now I guess let, let, let's go up a notch. And so I wanted to talk about how the same idea, how the same, the same trade-off, out of the box versus customized works for things like the layout of the files in a project, the configuration of the files in the project. Um, so I guess the example we can probably most easily use is Angular, because that's, well, that's one of the texts we've all worked on here and a lot, most of our audience, where so with either Angular CLI or NX, kind of the most popular next layer add-on to that, has a, I wouldn't say prescriptive, it has a highly defaulted configuration where you get a lot of configuration that just like, you know, you just, you, you say, make me a thing. It just makes it this way. So what do we think about laying out the files dividing files into components the way you name files the way you name directories about like kind of everything about how i you know, start with an angular app because that's the most specific uh, kind of doing it the default the, the way that tools do it by default versus adjusting the defaults which is the thing you can do you can go say oh uh, you know you know don't make a directory for my for each component there's a way to turn that off in the in the settings versus just you know chucking the structure entirely and doing a bespoke structure optimized for your project um like you know with a, with a, obviously we're not in a position to name specific companies but thinking about our last few client projects how, how close do we stick usually to the default way our tools want to lay out our files i think on my side like i go for full range of we used absolute default to having crazy custom schematics that will generate everything in the most super specific way that uses all of our stuff all pre-wired and everything like that so, so i think there's nice yeah, talk about both, the trade. so you so you've been living across this divide yeah so i want to hear about about the trade-offs and what you've liked and suffered from on each side of it yeah i mean one of the main trade-offs is we're the ones developing the schematics so anytime anything blows up or like there's a file that's misplaced and a whole bunch of people have already been using that mm -hmm. schematic then it's our fault. We got to fix it. Um, one huge thing actually is just when we update schematics, like, oh, we iterated on this, you know, we want this file in a different spot, or we're doing this something in a slightly different way, or we just have something new, like we got to add this every single thing inside the schematic. Then there's the process of, okay, we own the schematic, so we update that, but now we have to retroactively go through every single thing that's used our schematic and update those to basically kind of adhere to the new ways the schematic works. So yeah. it's nice. Like I love being able to use those schematics and just instantly get something that's good. And it works great for our developers. But being the ones that kind of have to maintain that is a bit of a pain sometimes. OK, so, so there's kind of an idea sneaking out there that if, if you vary from defaults, there's some, one way somebody might vary from defaults is just do completely ad hoc things all over. But, but you're not talking about that. You're saying, no, no, we're going to vary from the defaults, but within this family of projects that a team is responsible for, we're going to try to still be consistent. So we're internally consistent within our team or group of teams, but we're just not the same as what the platform default is, right? Yeah, you know, exactly. When I hear this, what it makes me, like the fear that's tingling for me is just remembering the days before the CLI existed when, uh, you know, so Angular 2, Alpha, whatever, and Beta 3 or whatever, um, when we didn't have a consistent way of doing things. And if you wanted to figure out how to write your unit tests, you were essentially finding some seed project somewhere and working with that until it stopped working and then hope that the person who did the seed project updated it. But oops, they, they abandoned it and they've never updated it. So you have to find a different seed project. Like, 
the further you get away from the stuff that's in the box, the closer you get to that. Now, I'm guessing that the team Zachary is talking about is not anywhere near the uh, horror uh, movie that I just described. But that's what I would be afraid of. Yeah, thankfully, it's not as extreme as like, oh, we're reconfiguring the entire way Jest or whatever works. Um, ours is, again, more just like, oh, we want to generate like X amount of libs and X amount of apps, and they all need to look and work this certain way or whatever as a default, instead of just getting like a very empty Angular app and a very empty Cypress app or whatever that you might have um, by default with NX, of course, because NX is a whole nother yeah, thing even like compared to Angular CLI. Bunch more. But, yeah. so, so speaking of NX, because NX has, uh, I'd say, has been iterating and evolving faster than Angular CLI. And so it kind of hits the kind of the pain you're talking about inside of a project is actually like a community wide experience with both Angular CLI and NX, sort of keeping up with the new way of doing things. Um, often there is an update schematic. So, a question, Zachary Have you been evolving old code to your newer ways within your family projects by writing an update schematic? or by manually editing them, or by doing some some other scripting to do them? Yeah, I mean, a lot of our stuff is thankfully just kind of like, a, oh, we added a new module or something to the app module or whatever for our schematic, and then we do a kind of retroactive fix or whatever. Most of it's been kind of manually by hand because at this point it's pretty simple. We only have like, I don't know, like 50 lives and like maybe 10 apps or something, um, which is small compared to what it might be in the future. So right now we're just like, sure, we'll just do the manual work and it's not too big of a deal, but it might be worth it in the future um, so, to write something that does it all automatically. I have done way too much, like more than a lifetime's worth of work with bash, find, sed, occasionally JQ, which can do structural edits to JSON files to like sort to try to like evolve a bunch of files to look like the new way. So, okay, so you do a find, and you structure the find to find the files you want, but you chop out the ones in node modules. And then you do like a grep to make sure you're get, only getting the ones that have like some little, some of the right marker. And then you do a sed to do some edit, except that if it's like a JSON file that might have some formatting differences, you, it's really hard to do that with sed, so you might use JQ instead. You might occasionally write a program and say, well, I can do a find and a grep to find the list of all the files. Then write a custom program to edit the files. Um, and sometimes meanwhile, like can, the manual work would take like 30 minutes and uh, like a podcast in the background. Uh, it, depends. It, it depends. It depends. It depends. Yeah. It depends. I, in our situation, it's like we might as well just do the manual yeah. work because the amount of files affected is probably small. Uh, I, I managed to get like surprisingly far actually sometimes with a, if you have a search and replace tool in your IDE, and your IDE can be, yes, that does can, help a lot. if you can target in a way that you can open all of the affected code in your IDE, which might span projects. So you might have to like, you know, put the projects next to each other in the file system and then open your IDE up a level so you can see all of them and do, do a series of search and replace operations. You, you need a reasonably powerful IDE where you can do search and replaces with uh, regular expressions and then use that to make a certain kind of edit across hundreds or thousands of files. Um, this, this works pretty well. Uh, it, it's, the nice thing about that approach is that you get to preview the change you're making a lot more easily Versus if you're using sed, you're sort of just you know taking shots in the dark and then going back and seeing how badly you broke everything and then rolling back the changes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reminded of when I first started using IntelliJ in uh, 2003, four. Before that, if we needed to, like, I, I remember on the project I was on then, we decided that ID should be capital I, capital D instead of lowercase ID or whatever it was. I don't remember the direction. Yeah. And so it was, hey, there's one guy who's really good with set and awk. And so he's going to do the the command for the entire workspace and then we'll run the test. And then you know, later we need to do something like that. And it's like, all right, well, IntelliJ will just do a refactoring. And that, you know, <laughs> it's so much easier not to have to do those things. It's, it's much easier. Like having refactoring tools is actually quite great when you're trying to keep up with underlying changes, right? It's, oh, the new way to do it, let me make that change using my refactoring tool so it doesn't break my code. Yeah. Um, okay, so all, along these same lines, kind of in this Angular CLI NX space, um, we have this substantial body of code that we use as our examples in teaching multiple different classes. And we're trying to make that code be exemplary where exemplary just means it's a good example. 
to be a good example, the code should look as much as it can like today's practices. It shouldn't look like last month's, last quarter's, or last year's practices. Now, it might actually functionally work totally fine if the files and the names and the structures look like last year. Like, it might execute 100% perfect. But for teaching purposes, we really don't want it to look like last, like we generated it last year. And I have observed, and I don't know if this is like globally true or just sometimes true, but I have observed that both Angular CLI and NX frequently offer updates or upgrade some uh, schematics that keep a project running, but which don't make it look just like it was freshly generated this year. So on small projects, I have worked around that by every year or two, literally generate a brand new project and copy all the source code into it. But we have well over 100 examples in this example repo I'm describing, and we want to keep up in a more fine-grained way. So I have actually taken to <clears throat> git ignoring many of the config files and having a generator that spits them out post-install. So I am... I, I don't want to do any more edits to keep up with the different ways of doing TS configs. And so, for example, now we have a program that we run that looks at all of our code and identifies what kind of thing am I looking at it, and then it emits the current way of doing TS config for that project so that when the official latest and greatest hottest way of doing TS config changes again, we'll make one small edit, edit to our generator's template and then 100, 100 plus projects will have the new TS config structure. Um, now, will that pay off? I don't know. That's just like a bet that the TS configs are going to keep changing. Maybe we're done. Maybe TS config is going to be stable for the next three years of Angular NX. But um, I do so like I, the fact that NX is kind of trying to help on that front because a lot of their stuff is just like, here's a file, here's literally where it's manually placed all of your libs and all of your apps inside that file. I know recently I, I just noticed this because I was messing around with some Jest configs and things like that. This is only really for Jest, I think, right now. But on the Jest config for like the projects and stuff like that that's supposed to look at, NX literally has like a Jest projects function that they call. So that, that file is extreme. Like it's literally six lines of code on this new workspace I'm looking at, and it just works. So yeah. I'm hoping that starts going further and further yeah. with a lot of things because Especially like if you're dealing with an angle at JSON or workspace.json, like if you have to deal with like merge conflicts on that file, uh, oh, yeah. you might as well just quit. Like it's really, really hard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on like a 60,000 line file. Th that's actually how we ended up with a. Uh, w so in our examples repository, we actually generate the angular.json file right. because it is, I think, at least many tens of thousands of lines. It might be over 100,000. And it has a fair amount of churn keeping up with, again, like what's the latest and greatest way that file should look. And the notion of more than one person working on a tens of thousands of line JSON file, maybe doing some search and replaces and generating merge conflicts, it's just like, it's just unthinkable yeah. to, to deal with that. Well, and then and, as we change the names of our lives because we do that frequently they are numbered in sequence but we renumber them frequently and so we would have yeah. to go through and reorder that and like yeah and this is a bit of a variance from a main topic which again for anyone who's just arrived as we're talking about the trade-offs between doing things the default way versus tweaking them up um it is incredibly frustrating when people make tools where the name of the thing has to appear inside the thing because that means if I want to take some chunk and I want to rename it or I want to put it from here over to there, I also have to edit what's inside of it. I think the ideal would be if I have a, like a directory that represents a library, if nowhere inside of that directory were you ever allowed to utter the name of the library. That would be the most ideal case, right? If the name of the library is the name of the directory the library lives in and you don't say the name inside, so, so it's impossible to have a conflict or a, uh, a missed edit between the name of a library and the, and the names that appear inside the library. 
Um, when and you so say we library, had, in this case, are you talking about a, like a third-party tool or an NX library? An NX code? library or Angular CLI, kind of that kind of, and, and it really, it, it applies, again, pretty, a lot more broadly than Angular, like a, a Python okay. library, a C++ sure. library, whatever. Um, but in the specific context here, the chunk of stuff you need in Angular.json, the name, which is at the top of the chunk of Angular.json, ends up repeated inside that chunk repeatedly. So you can't just take that chunk and go put it somewhere else under a different name. Your program that does this has to actually understand the contents of the chunk. So I, got, you know, I wrote the program that does this to go rename all the different places that the name of the thing occurs. Yeah. Um, and so is another example of this that the uh, boilerplate readmes that get created will include the name of the lib in them for an NX lib, for example? Yeah, I, I, I think that I'm very skeptical of boilerplate readmes for many reasons, including that one. Um, I think that, yeah, having the name of the lib inside, I think, is an anti-pattern. But worse, boilerplate readmes basically mean that readmes are useless. They, boilerplate readmes have basically ruined the value of readmes. Like there was, a, there was an early time when everybody would go look at the readme because it would contain the words the developer wrote to help somebody understand what to do. But now the readme in most, most readmes I see in like production code, right? And I'm not talking about like, you know, somebody's beautiful, glorious, polished up library they published on GitHub. Those always have a great readme, but on like internal production code that a lot of time and money are relying on, I almost always just see a default boilerplated readme that isn't, you know, contains things that aren't even true anymore of the code the readme is sitting next to. So I guess that's my rant for the, for the episode here. Um, okay, so I guess we've talked about the Angular CLI config stuff. How about, oh, Zachary, I know you've done quite a bit of CI/CD configuration. Have you found that you can pretty much sort of take a standard-shaped Angular program and ask for it to be CI/CD'd in a standard way, or have you found you need to tweak that immensely to get to get the results you need on a specific project or somewhere in between? I feel like it's like a literal individual Angular project. Um, I feel like you're probably pretty fine because the uh, use cases are pretty mild. In terms of just like doing linting, doing testing, doing E2E, whatever. Um, even just packaging and deploying it, it's pretty simple because it's a single app. Um, the times where I need to do more configuration and kind of veer from the norm is actually in an X, which is kind of funny. Because um, I have a lot of stuff that goes into like being able to do multiple libs, multiple apps, all this stuff, right? Um, that's where I've kind of veered the most in terms of actually setting up a CI CD and rather written like the most node and just raw um, JavaScript code and kind of bash stuff just to do things. Um, just cause either like, either it gives you the, ju like just not enough, like in terms of functionality, just like barely, um, or you just need to do something completely different and kind of hodgepodge some stuff together. So Which you, is the problem with mono repos, I feel like. Mono repos are yeah. the main thing that like you end up like hodgepodging a bunch of bash scripts and node whatever together. I feel like and, that's like the, the dirty secret of the world of, uh, of build yeah. tooling of all kinds is that there's a lot of beautiful computer science going on and then there is a whole lot of duct tape bash yep. holding it all together. <laughs> Pretty much. So uh, yeah, I'm going to oh, go have ahead. to find, the, there's a canonical XKCD about this. And I'm going to have to go find. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So uh, Zachary, do you, do you think that this need is driven more heavily by, like, it's actually a good idea, it's actually beneficial? Or do you, you know, are, are we like arguing that this is a good idea? Or are we just like describing a necessity? Um, I would say for us, it was kind of a necessity just because of the sheer amount of libs and apps we have where we really needed to do affected um, in terms of NX, we're talking pretty much only entirely about NX at this point, where we needed to run affected builds and tests and lints and whatever, because if you tr like edited one file in one lib and you tried to just say, oh, we're just gonna build everything, that's fine, it's like a pull request or something, you'd be sitting around waiting like half an hour <laughs> to see if your pipeline passed. Um, whereas if you just do an affected and one that's extremely paralyzed, 
um, it might take a few minutes or five minutes or whatever, right? Yeah, I think that's, that's so. there, there's a great broader idea there that very often the defaults in almost all tools that, that we hit on, even if the tool itself is purportedly for scale, for big complex work, it's very common for defaults to just not have the stuff you really need to work at scale. Um, and I, I don't, I'm not saying that's like a defect of the people making them, the people making these tools, they only have so many hours in the day, <laughs> like, like anybody else. But yeah, I, I feel like that there's often a necessity when you're building at scale to customize even like even if I, I think I don't know I got the impression from our discussion so far that we kind of all think it's really great to build a stick pretty close to defaults, but I we totally all seem to it. also just endlessly run into times that we can't. Yeah, it's pretty much just like go defaults until you just hit a giant wall and then frantically climb over it with your own stuff and then continue down the happy path again. So so let, let's let's I'm trying to think if we can uh, if we can go any more broadly so kind of beyond the sort of angular centric level. How about like, how about uh, like deployment? I guess, we're, I guess we're not, we're often not that involved in the, in the end deployment of our, well, our customer projects. Often the work enough. we do is like becoming <laughs> part of another, of a broader system, I guess. Well, another angle to look at this is what, what do you choose angular or react? Like right, right now react there are people who view React as the default, so by not choosing React, you are going off on your own way. Angular JS used yeah. to be in that position, and so just at that high level, um, you know, are you are you causing yourself any potential problem by not picking what is currently the most popular winner for whatever choice? Well, yeah, so, framework or library or you know npm versus yarn or whatever so, it is yeah i want to pivot back to another thing on that but yeah so that's a good point um and i actually think on the specific question of react i, I think that I, i'm just i'm a little bit disappointed and frustrated with people including some on twitter who are convinced that react is the default for all web application development because just numerically react is not it's not dominant enough to be the default. But if I just kind of pivot one step over, I say the default, the default thing to do is just choose whatever among Angular, React, and Vue. Because between Angular and React and, Re and Vue, you have just an absolute lion's share of the common ways to build single page apps. And so if you're gonna reach past Angular, React, and Vue to anything else, you're clearly doing something very non-default. Um, I feel like the nature of the work we do, being so enterprise-centric, maybe puts us mostly in spaces where the inclination to reach beyond those three is quite rare. How, how much do we see in kind of four corner, far corners of our customer projects anything that's not one of the big three? I can't think of anything recently, but I have, I haven't been on that many different projects lately to uh, say that I have a really good survey of the industry. I can say that we've we've in some cases even assisted on projects that touch a bit of Svelte, um, that touch some .NET Blazor, um, that that touch some uh, like kind of you know old-fashioned server-side web app stuff, but numerically, like in terms of the percentage of code bases very 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 tiny compared to the amount of big three that we see so that's interesting I, I wonder if i wonder if it's easier to easier to vary from the defaults on like kind of individual choices whereas like picking a framework for a company to build their suite of apps on it just feels very heavy to go beyond whatever you know the, the whatever the top handful of the day are I say the only thing I've ever seen outside the big three is even on client projects where like one or maybe two people just randomly went off and did like this very small thing or proof of concept or did some small application that they needed for a very small use and then they're done. And then they're just like, yeah, cool, we have this thing, we made it in Svelte or whatever, right, Blazor. Um, and then it never got touched again, so. 
versus like the actual main bulk of the work that's happening is on like one of the more established big three. Um, I've, I've kind of seen both directions. I've seen cases where an experiment becomes the seed that grows into a massive use of a technology. And I've seen cases where an experiment just, even if it's successful, ends up just an experiment. And there's just too many forces pushing back toward just do one of the big popular default choices. Hmm. Trying to think. Let's see, well, we're coming up on an hour here. I, I had one higher level to, to think about here, and this is like really taking it up a notch in terms of sort of how the you know management decision makers have to think at our customers. And that is, you could um, basically the default process, the default shape of software dev process for corporate America projects as of 2021, I would say is a somewhat locally tweaked variant um, of Scrum. So basically Scrum, but with some adjustments. I, I feel like I could walk into almost any very large corporate dev shop and it's probably 90% likely that they're doing something kind of Scrum-like, but with some local changes. Um, and I think among our customer base, that's again, over 90%. Any thoughts on that? Like kind of picking the default process of the day versus kind of going out on a limb and doing something different. Uh, I remember when XP was daring. I remember when Agile was like the word that was applied to the weirdos who weren't doing the default. I was mm -hmm. like, are you going to do the default or are you going to be Agile? Yeah. Whereas now, like doing something Scrum-like, and a minor <laughs> calling it Agile, um, is the default, right? And so like no one gets credit for being edgy today by being Agile because every process is described as Agile, and most of them actually are. Yeah, so, some reasonable percentage of the Agile vision is usually in most processes. Like, have we met anybody who like says, no, we're going to set aside the Agile default and we're gonna do this totally other, other way of doing things? Um, not explicitly, not in those words but often end up there anyway because of the uh, the structure that is given around it. Yeah. But, but they still use, uh, often will still use agile related vocabulary. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think I've seen that where kind of def default mainstream words, but kind of just different meanings under the same label. Yeah. Okay, most of our Previous projects I've been on, like a lot of times we do scrum up to an extent, um, you know, have our stories or whatever we're doing for X sprints, what up, yada, yada, tied to features. And then a lot of times, like, I don't know what it is about us in general, but um, a lot of times we're just efficient, I guess, um, or our velocities are just completely out of the ballpark. I don't know. But a lot of times we'll just get past the sprint and we're just like, all right, what do we do now? And then we just keep pulling in and doing other random stuff and then addressing the backlogs and things like that. Where most projects are just like, yeah, you stick to your scrum, you do that, that's it. And it's like no in between sometimes. And I think that can be a combination of our, you know, our expertise in the field. Yeah. And that's why people right. hire us. But also um, when I'm brought in as a contractor at a for a corporate client, I don't have to go to as many meetings as they do usually. And so... Sure. It just, I have more time, um, you know, as, as an inline developer, as I've been moving up into the management chain, I'm getting different meetings than I had before. But um, as a meeting are coming back. Yeah, they're coming escape. back in, in different form. But, but a, uh, you know, just being a, 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 a peon developer as a contractor versus a peon developer as an employee of the company, there's a lot of meetings that the contractor won't get invited to and that means that the contractor is writing more code. That's hilarious. Huh. So we sometimes get, 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 you know, get uh, summoned to offer a bit of feedback or advice on like, Hey, how, how's this thing working out? 
do we more often counsel to, hey, this team would benefit from adopting this, this default good thing over here and bringing it in? Or do we more often find that the advice we give is the team would benefit from doing this unusual bespoke thing? The area that comes to mind is we recommend NX all the time instead of doing bespoke CLI. That's I'm, I'm kind of thinking that the first one is like overwhelmingly the thing that we help people with yeah. is how to do things the standard way. Yeah, they're like, oh, I, I can see that the problem that's being addressed by some tooling here, by some process, by some application, whatever, is actually a pretty close to off the shelf thing, which can be solved in a pretty close to off the shelf way with just a few little tweaks. Let's help you just start doing this standard default good thing, and we will help you find the modest tweaks that are needed to make it work in, in this organization. So I guess that means we're kind of the, are we sometimes the opposite of iconoclastic? You summon, summon us as consultants and the first thing we'll do is just help you, help you catch up with everybody else. Everybody else is benefiting from chucking their bespoke, the bespoke mono repo management code and just bringing in this mono repo tool. And yeah, it, it might not be quite as built for purpose as your homegrown pile of scripts, but you won't do it. You, you'll, you'll, you will delete all the ongoing workload of operating and maintaining your homegrown scripts. Is that, is that true? Is that the kind of advice? I think, I think that is. So I, Lance, I think NX is a great example. Can you think of any other examples? M material? Uh, yeah. That, although that's a little more controversial in the, Angular world because uh, there's options, alternatives. That's, yeah, it's kind. Of, I mean, yeah, I, I wouldn't say well. Okay. Angular Here, material, it kind of is the default for Angular, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Here's another one. Prettier. Stop yeah. arguing about your semicolons and just turn on prettier and go. Yep. It, there's like only four or five settings that hardly anybody ever uses. So you get everybody together. You allocate three hours to argue about these seven settings and then never speak of it again. And ironically, the idea that came to mind as it was uh, semicolons, which is one of those seven settings. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh, or, you know, like, curly braces. You have the argument. Stop if, arguing about where you put your curly braces. <laughs> if, if, if necessary, you can even let it come to blows once. I prefer, I do not recommend this, but have the, have the disagreement by whatever means you have to, get through it, turn on prettier, and then never spend another dime hand formatting code. I think, I think that's, that, that, that's a case where just financially, how would you argue against the default? I mean, Prettier, I think, has become the default in the JavaScript world. And, uh, you know, I, I am hard pressed to think of any scenario where I think an organization would somehow deliver more value per human life spent by, by, by doing some custom way of hand hand formatting code. I mean, do we use Prettier on basically all projects now, right? It's it's helpful that it is a good default on NX at least. So. Yeah, yeah. So NX actually does Angular CLI arrive with Prettier yet? I know NX does. I haven't spun one up in a while, but I don't think so. I have found that Prettier is much less common on Node projects. But again, on, on Node projects, which are they're just JavaScript, TypeScript, whichever, we've seen a lot of benefit even when there's no Angular or NX to be seen. Let's stop, ar well, it's not supposed to stop arguing about semicolons. Let's figure it out once and then have it be automatic. Um, also, it just makes, like, I don't want to say I become a lazy developer per se, but a lot of times, like, it's like, I don't have to spend my time actually formatting the code. I hit save, it formats magically, I close the file, I move on. <laughs> I don't have to spend the extra five minutes like, oh, okay, this import goes here, this import goes up there, I need to add a comma to this line. Like it's, yeah, <laughs> there's no I, point. I remember reaching that point back in the, in my Java era, somewhere in the early 2000s, just one day realizing it and then taking probably a year to stop doing it. But I stopped ever indenting code by hand. 
I kind of stopped pressing the space bar, except if you really need it to like disambiguate if you, for a break between two identifiers, just type the code in the least keystrokes way and have it set to auto format on save or auto format on whatever. Yeah, so I, th I think we, we might have hit the first just unambiguous win for staying with defaults here. Yeah. In the Java days I had, there wasn't anything as uh, dominant as prettier. I looked at a few options whose names now escape me after 15 years. <laughs> but the big problem that I had is I would be using IntelliJ's defaults and the other uh, you know, three quarters of the team would be using um, uh, Eclipse's defaults and they were just a little bit different. Yeah. And so trying to find some third party tool that would hook into both that would just like, you know, figure out how to do the defaults in both tools. And it never quite worked out right. Prettier is so much better than that. I remember at one point, I think Eclipse had a setting where one of the, one of the, they had like a set of default formatting sets you could choose from. And I think one of them intentionally matched IntelliJ as close as possible. So if you as had a mix as possible, team. but they still never got everything oh. exactly right. Yeah, it's really hard to write two automatic tools that hit hit pixel perfect, right? They inevitably they disagree about this one space right here, and so it's a uh, hmm. So I was thinking about kind of the 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 process stuff a little more, right? Because this the I feel like this like the prettier thing. So choosing a default on prettier frees up your human bandwidth to spend on other things, right? And so like one of the thing, one of the ways that, that, that we help teams improve their process is by going to what I think is what should be a default, which I think kind of is a default, like should you do code review, right? Well, actually I think among like mature teams, there's not really a question. Of course you should do code review, right? Like, like to not, like code review is not so much a choice. Code review is the default and choosing not to do code review would be a weird thing um, with a combination of let's get prettier in so that we don't have any code review that has to do with like pointing out formatting errors, right? And then get, you know, linting in maybe for the same reason. Now you can more easily kind of adopt the, I hate to use the phrase best practice of doing code review. <clears throat> because you've cut down the noise of your code review to where it can really be about the semantics of the work being done. Yeah, having CIs in place that automatically do all that, I won't even touch a PR until the CI pipeline just passes. And then once I do, hey, everything, the code's clean, it yeah. works the way it should, all the linting's cleared up. So you're saying um, don't don't even bother to review a PR until it passes the I, I usually pieces. don't, like maybe sometimes, like if it passes the linting, if it passes pretty, if it passes unit tests, I might look at it. E2E is kind of a mixed bag sometimes of like whether I need to wait for it to finish, kind of depends. But yeah, I, typically it's just like wait for those like core ones so at least the code's good in terms of like viewing capability. Yeah. And then I'll go through and I like, actually review it, so. So are there any other cases, because I think this is actually a great pattern we, we, we've stumbled on here an hour in, of adopting the defaults kind of at one layer can give you freedom to do more, more useful things at a higher layer do we have any other examples of that? I'm, I'm thinking. Kind of, I guess, analogous to Prettier, you can adopt, the, I think there's like a, a package that's like, here's like a recommended set of lint rules. And just to get off the ground with linting, you can just adopt the recommended lint rules instead of hand crafting your lint rules. Yeah. And where I've run into this a little bit lately was I was talking with one of the other team leads on a different project with uh, Oasis Digital who was working on a different project at, at the same client as one of the projects I'm on. And we were talking, uh, considering the possibility of a uh, monorepo to combine, to do code sharing between our two apps. And one of the things that we talked about, it was like, what code had we shared already? And I mentioned that I had sent over the lint settings and such. And the other team leads response was, yeah, it was great to have a starting point. Didn't mean we kept them. So like, you know, he used that as a starting point and then that team had their own debate and, and maybe did things differently than what my team had chosen. Um, but at least it was a shared starting point, um, which isn't exactly what you were asking, but it came to mind. Okay, but no, actually I actually think that that, that that brings out another great trade-off, right? So the close, let's say you had five teams, 
that we're considering later coming together to work in a monorepo, if they all picked like kind of whatever the platform default is for their lint rules, if they didn't vary at all, then they would have zero lint friction coming together. If they started from a solid default and then they diverged a little bit, they'll have mild friction. But if they just both started with an empty lint file and started just making, you know, just making every decision independently, they would have a very big hurdle to come together. So mm -hmm. a trade-off is, this is almost like an echo of what we talked about, like you know, pair programming. Hey, if, if I'm using the, the, my, the default IDE key bindings and we sit to pair program, it's going to be a lot easier. This is like you know, five levels up at, at the idea of multiple teams coming together in a big organization. The closer each has kept to the defaults for all the settings that are kind of underlying the code that they're working on, the less friction if and when they need to share code or even come together in a monorepo. And uh, which means, since, since we've been doing a lot of helping companies monorepo, I suspect we're going to run into this bit many times over the next couple of years. Yeah. Funny enough, on the monorepo side, um, we've act at least current project, I guess, um, we've written custom uh, linting rules, which was a first for me. Um, like, like you wrote JavaScript to do your own linting rule? No, like, so uh, we were using TSLint, which we still need to convert over to ESLint, undergoing the process, um, but we wrote custom TSLint rules. Hmm. Um, so like the ones you would normally import from Git or from the modules, et cetera. Um, and ours were just like moderately simple things. Like we have a wrapper for HTTP client. We don't want people to use the default HTTP client. We want them to use ours, things like that. So we have like quite a few rules that are just kind of like so, so straight away from the norm default. So how does that, that rule see. work? Can you just make a rule that says you're not allowed to say HTTP client? Um, so it's interesting. Um, so it'd be basically kind of, <laughs> it's, so a lot of times, a lot of our stuff is based off of, at least in current version, um, Angular's TSNet. So they have some exported stuff that they give you to like traverse an Angular project and all the files associated like components, okay. um, imports, all that kind of stuff of TypeScript. Um, and then you're basically just kind of going through the nodes of lines of code and chunks of code. And for our case, we're just looking at import nodes. And if they import um, from this like domain or whatever, um, then they can't do that. And then they get a lint warning or error. And other things like that. We've traversed types of files. We've tried to traverse HTML files because people were naming their uh, IET then labels weird. So there's things like that. So a lot of different types. And you kind of have to relearn how to do lint rules every single time. Um, if you're doing like a TypeScript component or you're doing an HTML file, there's different ways to traverse it. Yeah. Yada yada. So <laughs> it's an interesting process. It kind of goes back to schematics, where it's just like you're the one that has to maintain this. And yeah, thankfully those are a little bit easier because you just write it once and it's usually pretty good. Now we have to convert those to ESLint, though. So who knows? <laughs> so this is like another example of creating a default within your own family of projects. Yep. So you got this kind of technical community inside of a large organization. And you're trying to create and then enforce that programmatically inside that, that internal community. Honestly, it's, it's mostly just to keep our PRs easier. So the people that are doing reviewers reviewing, which there's a subset of developers that do reviews, um, makes their lives easier. Like they don't have to like check imports to make sure you're not importing from the wrong thing or using the wrong thing, right? We enforce that with linting rules so that hopefully by the time you get to the PR, if linting, prettier, all that stuff passes, you can just look at the actual functionality of the code and what they're really doing and making sure that following best practices on that front or yeah, this, whatever. This, this just seems like a, a recurring theme in this discussion, right? Of either adopting a default or doing something the same way everywhere to make it a local default and then tooling it up so that you, you make a bunch of work that otherwise a bunch of people would have to do go away. Um, I guess that I guess that, that that should be always considered. Whenever, you, like, I guess at an individual level, <clears throat> if an individual likes tweaking their key bindings, well, like it's their key binding, right? Um, but at a t once you're looking at like how something is coded or configured as a team, it's like you really need to weigh the trade-off of if you vary from the defaults, you're either going to have increased human work or hopefully slightly increased coding, coding at once work to, in, to enforce your local default. I wonder, if the, I wonder if there's some 
something similar with processes also, right? Like a, let's say you're at a large firm. If you're just doing something somewhat scrum-like, you're probably not going to have to spend much time on your team discussing how your process works because every developer who joins will have worked on five other projects that did something, a generally similar process. Although you, every, you team have a, has a, yeah, go ahead. every team has a different definition of a scrum point or a story point. And every yeah. team has a different definition of what do we talk about during a retrospective or what tools do we use to do our retrospective and our estimation yeah. parties. It is not as standardized, at least in my experience. You know, I, I'm, I'm not a huge party goer, but I'm glad that I'm not an estimation party goer because that sounds like a really lame party. It's the term that I used in one of my projects and I keep carrying it through. <laughs> an estimation party. What's yeah. an estimation party like? Should we, should we throw one of those at the office at some point here? Um, I, sure. I like it. We should do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was a, a way of trying to make a not pleasant task sound a little bit less not pleasant. It didn't work at all, but it just kind of the name that stuck. Makes assigning arbitrary numbers to arbitrary things a little bit less painful. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I'm trying to think of is any any other higher like you know like anything else another level up where this comes into play. Um, let me think. Things like oh, so we talked about like a like NX as this con and a convenient tool for tooling for larger Angular React Node View etc. projects. If you adopt that and you adopt its preferred default testing tools, which are, mm -hmm. I believe, Jest and Cypress, yeah, correct. then you probably won't have to do hardly any maintenance ever of the configuration tooling around those testing tools. But if you vary from the defaults, even if the thing you pick to is better in some way for your specific project, it's going to have that cost of instead of people who work at that company over there maintaining all the config files, now people that work here have to maintain all the config files. Now, I, I, I think a, it, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, I have a funny story about that because like Cypress is obviously kind of the default with NX, uh, but one of my projects, they decided they wanted to do Gherkin on top of Cypress. Okay. So using like a Cucumber post processor essentially. And that was awesome. It works, it's cool, whatever. Um, using another third party library that accomplishes that. But um, that actually kicked us in the butt because we we're trying to upgrade to NX12 and all these things. And that was like the big Webpack 5 mm, um, okay. kind of system there. And our uh, Cucumber or Gherkin plugin didn't really care <laughs> about Webpack 5 as much. So we were just kind of stuck because, like, we've written all this massive swath of code in Gherkin and everyone is used to doing that and we can't really convert back at this point. So we just had to delay our upgrade for a while until Cypress and the plugin itself were more compatible with I, I the th thing. So. I think that's <laughs> another good like recurring theme though, right? So a, a benefit of staying close to defaults for at almost every level in all of this is that you can upgrade more easily and more quickly, right? If, if, I've, if I have customized my IDE extensively, then when the next version of the IDE comes out, there's a risk that I'll have to like undo some customizations or redo some customizations or they'll, they will conflict with stuff that's in the box on a new version. If I'm running pretty close the, to the default, I'm probably going to be able to adopt version N plus one about like that, you know, done. And I'm, I'm up and running. Um, and then, uh, you know, Angular CLI, if I'm sticking close to the defaults, new version comes out, I'm going to be up and running in 10 minutes or whatever. NX, it applies also. I think it applies during deployment. Um, if, you know, if you're deploying to some cloud provider and sort of whatever the standard way is, you're using one of their high-level services where you just provide a container and it just works, it's very likely that the next version of the platform, you'll be able to just keep sticking your container up there and it'll keep working. Um, if you have some hand-coded management of, of hardware resources on an individual level, you're probably going to have to do a whole bunch of work when the underlying platform upgrades. Um, I, I keep finding myself arguing, arguing against tweaking things, but then I find a lot of my own work is tweaking things. So it's kind of a strange, 
conundrum. I mean, I think it's a good standard to just try and stay as default as possible for literally everything. And then, obviously, if you hit a wall, just try and get over it by tweaking as much as possible. Yeah. We're at about an hour and a quarter here, so it seems like we kind of covered our topic pretty well. You got, anybody got any, any, any kind of closing thoughts along this, these lines here? Of tweak it up? Are, you gonna leave, are we going to leave this session and go like tweak your computer a bunch? You're going to go leave this session and go delete all of your config files and try to get back mm -hmm. to defaults? I think the message is on any, the more you have to work with other people, the less customization yeah. helps. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's a, that's, that's a great summary. So, hmm. Okay. Well, I, I, I certainly can't add anything to that chunk of wisdom. So I guess uh, we'll say goodbye to our audience here and uh, thank you all for watching, whether live or later. And uh, I guess subscribe, like, whatever, all the things you're supposed to do. See you later. Yeah.